dealing with the biggest story of the millennium, visits to planet Earth by alien spacecraft, successful cover-up of the best data, bodies and wreckage, for 58 years. The bottom line is I don't believe the, uh, the claim of the Air Force that all sightings can be explained. This is the biggest secret in the history of the human race and particularly in the history of modern government. We are being engaged as a planet and as a species by uh, other beings. The Canadian government is how I actually proved that the U.S. government was covering up their collection of UFO sightings and records. America and Britain have made it very clear to a lot of countries who have the same sort of sightings and the same resources that this is something that they better not let out, not until we say it's okay. If we would get off of this ego trip, this Western scientific ego trip, we would not become the virus of the universe that we are. Nobody really wants us out there. The dependence on oil could be ended overnight. We're being slowly conditioned to understand that there is life outside this planet and that we probably live in a universe and a galaxy teeming with life. I had my own UFO sighting and said, well, case closed. There's nothing like seeing one for yourself to uh, end the debate. I'm absolutely sure that we are not alone in this universe. We invite you now to come with us upon a great and wondrous journey, an adventure perhaps into your very own past, present and future. See and hear the real stories, and most importantly, be introduced to the actual individuals who have volunteered to come forward to speak the truth. Flying saucers exist. Are extraterrestrials real? Is there a government cover up? For nearly 60 years, denial has been the only official position of the governments of the world relative to UFOs, alien abductions, and extraterrestrial contactee reports. Endless debates have raged over the thousands of documented cases that have been brought forward without official recognition. Some have been monumental incidents involving hundreds or even thousands of people. Roswell, New Mexico, USA. July the 4th, 1947. A flying disc crashed. The debris and alien bodies were flown to Wright Field Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. Suffolk, England. Rendlesham Forest, December the 26th to 28th, 1980. A triangular shaped object illuminated the entire forest with white light. The object had a pulsing red light on top and a bank of blue lights underneath. It left ground traces and radioactive anomalies. This was a multiple witness sighting by military personnel. Belgium. The Belgium Wave, October 1989 to 1990. Hundreds of reports of lighted objects frequently described as enormous and triangular in shape. Air Force F-16 chased many of these objects. The Belgian government cooperated with civilian UFO investigators. Arizona, USA. The Phoenix Lights. March the 13th, 1997. A huge V-shaped object hovered over Phoenix for 10 to 15 minutes, observed by tens of thousands of people. Mexico. The Mexico Flap. Hundreds of objects appearing alone and in clusters appear throughout Mexico, observed by tens of thousands of people. Flying saucers are real. On the Black Vault, you can download documents that prove that the United States Air Force bases have been breached by UFOs, their air restricted airspace. 
Um, the missile silos have mysteriously been shut down due to UFOs hovering over the base. Um, I think you download that and you read it, uh, you conclude, yeah, okay, UFOs pose a national security threat to the U.S. government. And in 52, I was an eighth grader and old enough to read for myself the big scream headlines that July about UFOs flying over the nation's capital and the uh, Air Force planes not being able to catch them. They're there and they're paying attention. Incidents happened in Soviet Union before it collapsed. Incidents happened all over the northern U.S. on ICBM bases, where they came down, hovered over the silos, played hell with the electronics. Pictures were taken. Hundreds of witnesses watched them. Highly classified, you'll never hear that, except from whistleblowers and big mouths like me. Well, while I was attending uh, Northrop, Aeronautical Institute and working for uh, Douglas Aircraft in El Segundo, California. I had heard about George Adamski in, in uh, one of the Sunday newspapers. He had his story and his pictures of contacts plus pictures of his ships. Well, I had by that time seen so many during the day and the night that I felt I would like to go up and meet this gentleman. <laughs> On the weekend, he would entertain people who would come to see him military people, engineers, scientists, uh, people from all walks of life. Uh, he had taken some beautiful pictures of the scout craft as well as the carrier ships. I went up to see him. He had a six inch telescope that he used to take the pictures of the flying saucers. And in using that scope, when I finished, I was just about to take my eye off the eyepiece when there was a blue white streak. <laughs> that went by and I jerked my head up to see if I could see it and I didn't. And uh, I looked at his 15 inch telescope dome, which was a couple of hundred yards from his house. And there was a big flare up blue white light. And then it kind of closed back down, no noise. First I thought it was an explosion, but it was a little slower than that. And there was uh, an elliptical flying saucer it looked to me like it was hovering above the ground. So I heard it increase its frequency and it got brighter and brighter and it was really pretty hard to look at. And it shot straight up until it looked like one of the stars. If you've ever been to Mount Palmar at night on a dark night, boy, they're big and bright. And it stopped for an instant and then it shot over the horizon over San Diego. We have more than one witness who have been involved in the uh, tracking of these objects on radar. You know, many people say, well, look, if this stuff was real, why are there no radar reports? I said, we have them. We actually have the radar tapes from the FAA. This is not just UFOs, and this is not just not being visited by guys from other planets. I was to learn later that our security, our intelligence people, our military people, concluded and learned we were not merely dealing with interplanetary visitation. We were being visited by guys from other star systems, which technologically, you know what that means. They're not just from another like planet like Venus or Mars or somewhere. These guys are from other stars. I'm convinced after studies since 1958 that the evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. In other words, some UFOs are alien spacecraft. Most are not. I don't care about those. Most isotopes aren't fissionable. I don't care about the ones that aren't if I want to build a reactor. If somebody who had the clearance to carry nuclear weapons or launch nuclear weapons saw these objects over a nuclear facility and reported it and have documents to prove it happened, this is dispositive. That's what someone who is wanting to look into this who says, well, could this really be true and I don't know about it? They need to look at that and we've assembled it. We have a 600 page book of top secret documents and the transcripts of these witnesses. We have videotapes. So I began watching the newspapers for any newspaper reports. I started buying magazines that had a UFO article in the magazine and, and collecting these. And from those I would get names and addresses. And, and I often called the people who wrote the articles to get them. Then I'd go interview those people myself, and if they took pictures, I'd try to get a copy of the picture, and frequently did. And then I began trading the pictures that I already had with other people that had pictures to get more pictures, and eventually built a library of pictures, probably the largest in private hands in the world, is over 4,000 pictures of real UFOs. 
Now, if I can collect that many alone as a single individual working by myself, how many pictures do you think the government has got when every government employee is a potential investigator? Every agent on, on trained investigator, all collecting and contrib contributing to the government file. They must have hangers full of pictures. What Air Force Manual 10-206 says is that a U.S. Air Force pilot who sees a UFO has to report it in a particular way and manner. They outline in this form exactly how to report it. They say list the size, the shape, direction of travel, how big the object was, what were the wind conditions like. And you go through this big form and say, you know, your UFO sighting. The manual then go on, goes on to state that you have to forward this to the NORAD installation. This is that one Air Force base that claims, oh no, we haven't collected these things since uh, 1969. The problem is, is this form was last updated in October of 2004. In 1977, I uh, proposed and became uh, director of a proposed extraterrestrial communication study done in conjunction with the Jimmy Carter White House. Jimmy Carter, of course, had had a um, close encounter with a UFO in the company of 10 members of the Leary, Georgia Lions Club in 1969 while he was running for governor of Georgia. While he was governor of Georgia in 1973, he had filed an official UFO report. It's now on, on, on the internet so everybody can see it. The 1976 U.S. presidential campaign was extraordinary because it was waged between Jimmy Carter on the one hand, he's had a close encounter, and the first campaign waged on a platform which included a disclosure plank <laughs> of sorts. Jimmy Carter was asked that on various occasions, and this is documented, once elected, would he open up the extraterrestrial UFO files? And he said, yes, he would. We have over 450 military and intelligence witnesses. Some are, they range from generals and brigadier generals to air traffic controllers and strategic air command uh, personnel in the Air Force to uh, civilian people in the uh, FAA, the Federal uh, Aviation Administration, uh, to astronauts and cosmonauts. And it's an enormous uh, database of, of people who have up close and personally seen UFOs or worked in those projects uh, in their capacity as a government uh, or military person. Even with the massive amount of pressure governments can exert to maintain the ongoing cover-up, people continue to come forward and tell what they have personally experienced. Like that, 15 miles in a fraction of a second. I disengaged the autopilot to push your nose over because we're at a collision course. And when I did, I just saw it head on, it's 300 feet in diameter. We knew that, we had a knowing, like somebody was telling us, 300 feet in diameter. So at that time I heard a hell of a noise. And I said to him, what the hell was that? He said, well, the navigator and the radio man ducking fell, it hit their head, one hit their head, it hurt their arm, they were scrambling on the deck, so a hell of a noise. I thought it hit us underneath. So I said, well, where in the hell did it go? And Fred said, it's right over to the right. I can see, I couldn't see it. So it drifted forward about five miles from it. it, never got to the altitude that we were at, a few hundred feet below. I began to watch it, well, we knew then it was a friendly encounter, it just wanted us to see him. So then I went to, to engage the autopilot again. The magnetic compass was going like this, and the bird dogs, which is direction finder, the two of bird dogs, they were pointing right at this thing, just vibrating like this. And there were a lot of electrical things in the airplane that went haywire. So I told Fred, did you see that coming? He says, hey, well, it was close, close, close. It was doing this. <laughs> and so I, I went back to the vacuum operator. That's the old airplane, the vacuum operator, the hydraulic operator control. So I go back to that. So, so then we sat there and watched it for a while because it just paced us, stayed with us. And so the other crew, when they landed at large engines, so I had sent back, they came forth. Al Jones, which was the original plane commander, took my seat and the, it was still there. He was watching. And as I was walking back aft, he decided he was going to chase it. <laughs> and so he disengaged it. When I get back aft, I wanted to see how the passengers were doing. They're all on the right-hand side. They could see it underneath the wing. And then, I, oh, hell, I recognized the doctor back. back. He was a, a psychiatrist out of Bethesda 
Naval Hospital, plus a lot of other things. So I said, better talk to him first. So I, Cornell said, did you see what we saw, Doc? Doc, he grinned at me and looked at me straight down. Yeah, he says, yeah, that was a flying saucer. I didn't look at it. I don't believe in such things. When I was 16 years old, I was walking down the street in Arlington, Virginia, and saw seven red light type UFOs over Washington that uh, made headlines around the world. And since then, I have seen eight alien vehicles on eight occasions. The sightings I've had are more things flying right by or bluish green orb things. I've, I've had five sightings. Uh, never reported them because I don't need the grief. But the, the trick is you, don't, you can't mention the company name or be in company uniform. Two of my friends, excellent pilots, one of them was uh, a famous pilot and he, they both got fired for doing interviews like this but they were in uniform. Since I've been a child I'm looking up into the sky thinking is there more than just us human beings, beings in this huge universe and now I do believe there is more life forms, different life forms and more dimensions than we can perceive. I've had several sightings probably the uh, the closest uh, sighting would have been um, Back in 1974, I was driving back uh, between Ottawa and Montreal, going towards Montreal. And um, I remember going on the highway and we came within literally probably several hundred feet of a huge, huge ship. And at first, uh, you know, we were driving away here and I'm, I'm thinking, am I really seeing this? And we slowed down and sort of peeked out and an enormous, enormous ship. I would have to say that it was two, three, two, three times the size of a, a 747. And it completely silently glided over across the highway and we saw it go off into the uh, distance. So there was no mistaking that that was not anything at that time uh, that would have existed uh, conventionally or militarily. I was a lieutenant from the Bulgarian Air Force. My plane was MiG-21. What I believe, I believe there is much more going on than we can see with our naked eye. Being in the 3rd Battalion, 7th Marine Regiment, we were pretty active. We were on the East Coast in an area called the Punch Bowl, which was just down the road from Heartbreak Ridge. We had a lull in the fighting, so we just sat around and played polka. And somebody looked up and said, what the heck is that? We all looked up. And there was, uh, it looked for all the world like a chrome hubcap setting up above us. And it, if you looked at it, it kind of had a watery, shimmery look and a little bit blue, bluish white periphery. And from time to time, it would appear to be elliptical and sometimes circular. So I imagine it was rocking a little bit. And uh, it was just a hint of a, of a dome sometimes on it. But we watched it, and our colonel came out and took a look at it. And he made a phone call. Pretty soon, four F 86D model uh, Sabre Jets came out, and they tried to get to the object. And it appeared that they hit some barrier that you couldn't see because they would stall out and do a one and a half turn spin and then pull out at the bottom. Flying Saucer finally decided to leave and got very, very bright. And it was pretty difficult to look directly at it. But it rose straight up and it went through the overcast. Now when it went through the overcast, there were three black rings that radiated from the flange of the craft and went from the flange of the craft all the way over the horizon with no sound at all. And what it looked like was somebody dropping a pebble in a glassy pool of water and the rings were spreading out. In January of 05, 524 in the evening, I was driving south on Interstate 25, south of Denver, and I see this black object coming up the, the, the road, above the road, in the sky. And I thought, that's curious, what is that? As I get close, as we close, I see that it is a solid object. I thought it might have been Canadian geese for a start. I thought it might have been a piece of plastic blown up in the breeze like a kite. But I could see it was a solid object 
It was not affected by a breeze in any way. It was flying on a straight course. It looked black. It may have been some color, but because it was silhouetted against the sky, it, it looked very dark. It looked like a plank. It looked like a board, an oblong shape. It was bizarre. It, it had a couple of little bumps on the leading edge on one end. I thought, well, if it's just junk, that would be random, perhaps. It certainly wouldn't be symmetrical. And I looked out the other side, and sure enough, it had the identical bumps on the other side of the leading edge. So it was a, an anomalous object. Could I identify it? Heck no, I couldn't relate to it. It had no sweep bag, no anhedral, no dihedral. Didn't have any external power plants, no wings or no, no tail, empennage, uh, flight control surfaces or um, probes. A search of the term fast walkers on the internet immediately reveals references that fast walker is a code name used by various government agencies to refer to UFOs or, as they are sometimes called, non-referenced targets. Okay, this holds them pretty well. Craft that I re recorded that did the 180 degree turn down on this portion of the screen, they're called fast walkers because of their speed. The whole episode took about a half a second to perform or less. They're talking milliseconds. And that kind of lets you know that it's not an Earth satellite that we're looking at because it's moving so fast. Plus the fact our satellites don't change direction 180 degrees without changing speed or 90 degrees. And I, I have seen many of the shadows go up and do a 90 degree right across the screen. And sometimes you'll see three or four objects in formation, it looks like formation flying, and one will branch off to the left and one will go to the right. Somebody coined the phrase fast walker, and uh, it's appropriate. The fast walkers are these very rapid moving um, electrogravitic and anti gravity disks and craft of various shapes. The National Security Agency actually for a long time had called these ETVs, extraterrestrial vehicles and from the military who have tracked these objects. And uh, they've been called fast walkers because, as opposed to slow walkers, which are satellites, because they move at enormous speeds. For example, they've been tracked at going tens of thousands of miles per hour in the atmosphere and make a right-hand turn without decelerating. Well, you can't do that with a conventional system. You have to correct for gravity and mass inertia. That's what these things are doing. So these have been tracked on uh, dedicated and classified radar systems. Occasionally, people who are on an ordinary system will pick them up. Today, the internet is literally alive with websites that are filled with detailed reports, many of which include convincing videos and pictures of unknown crafts and alien-like creatures. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. I am a sky watcher, a UFO hunter. I have a website called cnufos.com. I had an interest in UFOs my whole life, but officially got started on April 15th of 2004 when I walked my dog in the middle of the night, looked up in the sky and saw some strange lights. I've got over 200 UFO video clips on my website. I, I'm more interested in the day footage. Now the day footage is completely different um, because that's harder to dismiss, you know, so I would have to say every other month it seems like I'm catching something. And I go out every day, pretty much six days a week, a couple hours a day. You know, you add all those hours up and that's a lot of time just to catch one thing for 20 seconds. But that's more than most people see in a lifetime, so I think that's better than nothing. Well, I'm involved in the political resolution of the what we now call, I, I prefer to call the, the uh, truth embargo that the government imposed on the facts regarding an extraterrestrial presence. That presence uh, has been established, I think, many times over by the citizen science research that's been going on since the 40s. Uh, the government did studies, but they were primarily for show. And the issue uh, from a government standpoint has been managed very intensely since 47, at minimum. Uh, ma managed in the sense that the government was going to deal with it, but deal with it within the national security structure and never acknowledge that there's anything to this. But in fact, there is. I mean, we are being engaged as a planet and as a species by uh, other beings. Uh, possibly multiple species. This has just been proven beyond any doubt at all. Uh, anyone who reads the research who isn't uh, compromised by being 
uh, either an idiot or an employee of the government management uh, of the issue can only arrive at one conclusion. The evidence is overwhelming. Uh, videotape, daylight disc, nighttime disc, photographs, direct pilot sightings by the thousands, millions of sightings around the world, direct testimony from direct government involvement, and of course you've got an entire contactee uh, body of evidence that's now in the tens of thousands of reports. Now, like never before, astounding events are transcending national and geographical boundaries currently happening in Brazil and Mexico. Unprecedented UFO sightings are sweeping the entire area of South and Central America. Does the key to understanding UFOs and aliens and their relationship with each of us lay in being able to simply perceive what is in a higher spectrum? like seeing the infrared range or other dimensional frequencies, images gathered from infrared cameras in Mexico and the special cameras used in Brazil seem to indicate that the aliens and their crafts may in fact be all around us. Jaime Massan is one of Mexico's foremost journalists. Internationally known and respected for more than three decades of journalistic work, his investigations and reporting in the UFO field have made him an icon to UFO researchers worldwide. Jaime's weekly network television show, 60 Minutes, in Mexico reaches millions of people each week and regularly carries segments on the subject of UFOs. This flag has been recorded in video. It means that we have evidence to prove that something is really happening in the Mexican Republic. Uh, the video camera had become the most important instrument to really capture this uh, new reality. Even the Mexican Army, the Air Force in Mexico, recorded UFOs that uh, the video was given to me, and I released that to the world. In that case, that happened on March the 5th, 2004, uh, the soldiers were able to record something that they couldn't see with their own eyes. And that's amazing, that was the first time Someone recorded something that it wasn't, they weren't able to see. With Jaime Maussan aboard a plane coming from San Antonio to Mexico City flying over a place called uh, San Luis Potosí to, to film a UFO following the plane. It was detected by the radars and I have everything on film. So for us it's normal. Maybe because we're searching for it. Maybe because we are trying to look for this reality. Maybe they are following us. I don't know, but it happened to me that at least 50 times, maybe more. There are objects that we cannot see with our own eyes, but they are there, they are watching us. In the last months in Mexico, after thousands of videos, we have been registering some of the most spectacular videos you can see hundreds and hundreds of objects making formations and flying together exactly uh, the same thing that you can see in the military video. These formations moving at the same speed in the same direction uh, uh, at the same altitude. As the more one researches, the more one discovers that literally tens of thousands of very credible people of every age, occupation and nationality are claiming that they have had personal contact with either aliens or interdimensional beings. Credible researchers now say that as many as 60 different species of intelligent, superconscious beings have been interacting with humanity for millions of years. Physically, they look, they're humanoid. Their skin is as white as a piece of paper. Throughout much of their adult life, they're the same height that I am, 5'11", 6 feet tall. Their eyes are perhaps twice as large as ours. They're typically blue eyes with white pupils. Although when they, when they get older, especially the men, their eyes take on a pink shade. Their eyes stretch further around the sides of their head than human eyes do and their, their ears and their nose are only about half the size of human ears and noses, and their ears lay back along the side of their head more than a human does. They have, their lips are not as prominent as humans, 
and they don't have teeth, they just have ridges because they're plant eaters, they don't eat meat. How can we know for sure exactly how many extraterrestrial races are visiting us or interacting with humanity? I mean, there are different sources um, disclosing some of that information. I found the most credible to be whistleblowers, people who have worked in these um, various secret projects who in some way have kind of been given information that gives them an idea of exactly how many races are, are here. One of those sources is a, a, a sergeant who worked in the, for 22 years in the Air Force, uh, uh, Clifford Stone, um, and he was involved in these uh, top secret projects that involve the retrieval of crashed disks. And in that process, he was able to get quite a bit of information on how many extraterrestrial races are visiting us. And he, he came up with the figure of 57. Uh, others have come up with uh, slightly more. Um, another prominent uh, whistleblower uh, or uh, a former employee of, of the CIA is John Lear. And he talks about uh, over 60 races that are visiting the Earth. On one night, I saw between 200 and 300 different tall white individuals there were so many I couldn't count them, uh, lined up along the mountains to the east of, uh, up along where the ammunition bunker was, uh, on the night that the tall white lady known as Pamela was supposed to finish her um, <laughs> final exam to be head of the t technology transfer team to go into Livermore. In amongst those two or three hundred tall whites, and that's just an estimate because I, I, I couldn't, there was, it was a crowd of people and I couldn't count them all. There were also American Air Force personnel, uh, um, nobody below the rank of colonel. There, were, there was like a four-star general, a three-star general. There were several of them. There were also several American government people in civilian clothing over there. Could it be possible that our universe is not only immense, but that it is full of life? and that there is a great diversity of this life spread throughout our own local galaxy and even our solar system. Equally outstanding is the recent revelation by the government of Brazil of their intent to turn over the official UFO files dating back to as early as 1954 to the people of Brazil. Well, the Virginia case is probably the best well-documented case that we have in Brazil and probably in the world. Yeah, you know that over 80 witnesses came forward, first-hand witnesses came forward during the first weeks, and they are still coming after it happened. During all these years, we still keep getting witnesses that come forward and tell us pieces of the big story that we know that in comprises the capture of at least two alien creatures in the city of Virginia. We know for a fact, because we have it all documented, Plus, the witnesses have confirmed and cross-confirmed that one alien was captured in the morning of that day, which was a Saturday, about 10.30, by a fire department and uh, some personnel from the Army. Another creature was seen at the same day by the middle afternoon by three girls. It was them who called attention of all the city to the fact that strange creatures have been seen because when the first one was seen in capture in the morning, it didn't draw too much attention. But at the afternoon, when the girls saw another creature and then spread the word to everybody, we saw the devil, that's what they thought they saw. That night of the Saturday, January 20, 1996, that second creature, probably the same one saw by the girls, was also captured by a police troop, a police car, actually a military police car with two policemen inside. The one who was sitting in a passenger seat was Marco Elixerezzi. And he was lucky enough to be the one who spotted the creature and grabbed it with his own bare arms, bare hands, got back to the car, put the creature in his lap and took it to the hospital. 25 days after that, he died on February 15 of some bacteria attacks proven that his immune, immune deficiency, deficiency system was absolutely destroyed. And uh, army personnel and authorities kept it all secret for lots of time until the UFO researchers started protesting 
along with the press, and we did so much pressure that eventually information was released about it. The exobiological aspect of the probability of life out there has actually increased over what it was in 1950. And the uh, indication that there may be ways of traveling faster than the speed of light so that, hey, they can get here from there. It doesn't mean that they're coming in five minutes or they're coming every hour or every day, but you know, they might be able to traverse dis huge distances in a period of weeks or months or something instead of spending hundreds or thousands of years. Well, look at the UFO sightings. Maybe they provide the answer that they are here. There was talk in the war room about a study that was underway. And this study became initiated in 1961 as a result of an event that occurred early February in 1961, where a flight of unidentified objects were flying from the Soviet sector to the east over the Warsaw Pact toward the west over the NATO lines. These Objects were very high, they were very fast, they were in formation, they appeared to be circular in shape, and they were obviously under intelligent control. They came in a formation of well, what appeared to be almost a hundred of them. And they flew in formation at a high rate of speed from the east over NATO, over the channel, southern coast of England, where they turned, flew north, and disappeared from NATO radar over the Norwegian Sea. We found out that the Soviets had gone on alert. The Warsaw Pact had gone on alert because they picked them up. All of our air force and radar sensory devices picked them up. NATO thought those objects belonged to the Russians. We found later that the Russians thought they belonged to us. Both forces were to find out later that they didn't belong to any of us, that they belonged to somebody else. And of course the big question is, who the hell do they belong to? Who are they? What are they? Where are they from? They demonstrated incredibly high technology. They, uh, they were not jets. There were no contracts. They were circular, they were metallic, and they were in formation. They moved, obviously, in under intelligent control. NATO shaped Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers initiated a study in 1961, which was underway when I arrived in 63, to determine what the hell these things were. Some experts now claim that societies exist in our universe at every conceivable level of social and spiritual development. Societies and civilizations that express themselves in countless manners of physical forms and spiritual ways. Have great wars and conflicts occurred within our own solar system? Does our true planetary past include rebellions and disputes that have raged throughout our heavens? In our distant past, have massive spacecrafts rained destruction down from the heavens, ravishing continents and destroying advanced civilizations? Genesis 6.1 When men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. The historical record is plain. This has been a phenomenon that's been around since our recorded history. The Vedas, the Hindu Vedas, which are among the oldest writings in the world, talk about the flying Bahamas and how that they were used to launch weapons and blow up cities and all this stuff. You know, uh, again, we've got Ezekiel and, we've, and uh, it just goes all the way back. So they've been here all along. If their game plan was like an Independence Day type invasion where they're going to blow up everything and eat everybody or whatever, it would have happened long before now. My main question was, is God out there too? If God's on this planet, is he out there too? And those questions were answered by reading the Bible. And that really set me on this journey to understanding the abduction phenomenon. What, what is the uh, reasoning for this? Who's doing this? And, and all of those questions that we all ask. We think of aliens and we think of angels as you know, divine beings that we have no idea of and we don't see, we don't communicate with on a daily basis. But it is not only the Bible and other holy works that are filled with references to UFOs and extraterrestrials. 
drawings, paintings, stone carvings, and even coins reflect strange humanoid-like creatures and their flying crafts. Serious researchers now say that the real question is not whether there are abductions occurring, but are the abductions to help or to harm us? And the greys were authorized to, sort of like a Noah's Ark, to develop a full genetic and DNA bank of all flora and fauna on this planet so as to replant it centuries down the road after the catastrophe. Can you imagine any president, whether it be Bush or Clinton or whatever, standing before the public and saying, yes, I am aware that we have this joint program with some aliens to upgrade our biological computers to build better bodies to house our souls in future incarnations. You can't talk about things like that. He wouldn't be able to do the job we hired him to do. What we know of the reptilians are by a number of uh, abductees, contactees and also whistleblowers is that there seems to be a lot of evidence supporting the existence of this race of beings on the planet for thousands of years. In other words, that uh, we might consider them to be an, an indigenous Earth species, an advanced non-human species that has lived on the Earth for thousands of years and actually may have played a, quite an important role in the genetic manipulation or engineering which supposedly has happened when it comes to humanity. There are various groups and individual species who from time to time come and visit this planet, zoop around, and I think that to try to ascribe any one particular motive to them is uh, tantamount to us looking up at the air at a Boeing 767 aircraft and saying, are those people good or bad? You know, you, you just can't ask that. It's just, it's a group of people, a group of intelligent beings. Some of them are good, some of them are not so good. But I will say this, I don't think there's any re reason for great fear and anxiety. Most recently, two new terms have emerged that also describe human-alien interaction. The most widely used is the word experiencer for those who have had some sort of experience, good or bad and participator, which has been coined to explain the cases where the individual may have been an abductee originally, but has transcended that situation by now volunteering to participate with his abductors. My contact with extraterrestrial intelligence occurred when I was aboard my sailing boat in Hawaii in the Honolulu Harbor. And it was early one morning, it was about five o'clock and I had gotten up early and I had gotten a cup of coffee and I'd gone back to my bunk and I was just laying there completely dressed, trying to uh, just look at the beautiful sunrise that was occurring through the, the large skylight above my bed. Then suddenly the most incredible energy enveloped me and the whole room began to like glow and glisten and a beautiful woman materialized right next to my bed. And it, at first I thought I was dreaming or hallucinating. And I said, you can't be real. And she said, well, I am. And I said, well, why are you here? And she said, I'm here as a representative of a group of friends that uh, want you to come to a briefing. The room was lit up completely, but my eyes were closed. I knew somehow not to open my eyes. There was something telling me, don't open your eyes because you won't like what you're going to see. Um, Eventually, I did open my eyes because I could hear a noise in the room. There was like scuffling on the floor. I opened my eyes. There were three small grey beings with big black eyes and big heads and very skinny, spindly limbs. Um, they, they pulled me up out of the bed. And then with one behind me and one each side of me holding my elbows walked me towards the window and I'm thinking well the windows are closed guys so you better open them before we go any further so there was this rationality and irrationality going on at the same time. I boarded what could be called a, a saucer it was some type of an interdimensional vehicle that uh, took me to the briefing that was occurred on a, a planet the local planet here in our system it was Jupiter and the whole planet just radiated with the energy. And I spent time there with these incredible P 
people, our beings, and I got a glimpse of mankind's destiny or future as it was possible. And as we approached the window, I closed my eyes. And as I did, I felt this stickiness. It was like, it was a stickiness and a feeling of something being pulled very slowly across my face. It wasn't painful, it was just very, very weird. Um, the next, I opened my eyes because I felt cold, I felt wind on my face, and I was aware that I was now floating outside of the window, three stories up, looking down at the car park with a very bright light above my head. Um, I couldn't really see what was above my head, I was just aware of this very bright light, one little grey on each elbow, I was aware of them, and we, we floated up into the craft. And people have said, well, then you were abducted. And I said, no, I went very willingly. And they've also asked, uh, how can you tell if you were to meet an extraterrestrial? And I would have to say the energy field, because when they're in your presence, they absolutely resonate at a frequency that's so much higher. And uh, it can only be described as dealing with them could be described as ecstasy. I had been taken in the middle of the night uh, while I was asleep and um, I was asleep through the whole thing until all of a sudden I felt something, some pressure going up my nose and it, it startled me so much that I opened my eyes and when I opened my eyes I saw this uh, large headed being with uh, gray skin, large black eyes and uh, small other features. Uh, that was looking down at me and his um, he had long fingers that he was using to hold this instrument that he was using to shove up my nose. I feel knowledge is power and someday maybe next week maybe tomorrow maybe five years from now we're going to get all of the proof we need that somebody exists hey, an ET might show up and I might actually get an interview. The point is that the more we know about this subject, then less legend can take over. If you see a craft hanging near you, don't get out of the car, don't stop the car, don't see what's happening. If you see one coming towards you, you don't have to be an abductee if you don't want to be. They go away, evidently, we have tens and tens of people telling us, said, I don't want to do that anymore, and they let them go. What we call abductions, or certain categories of abductions, took place as a result of an authorized genetic upgrade of the human race, trying to get us out of our warlike ways and ecologically ecocidal ways. The indigenous reptilians seem to have a very strong interest in the biosphere of Earth being stable, that it's not uh, jeopardized unduly. And some who have kind of uh, analyzed what the reptilians have been doing or had some kind of interaction believe that this is because the reptilians view humanity as a resource. And they don't want that resource to damage itself or damage the biosphere. They had about 18 scientists that all had been working on the project, various stages of the project, gathered around a big oval table in the Los Alamos headquarters with Edward Teller, the head of, a, of, of the Atomic Energy Commission, sitting at the head of the table. One of the aliens on the opposite side of the table from my engineering friend put in a white shirt and slacks so he would look less alien but he still had his alien bigger head, bigger eyes, black eyes, black eyes. And he was sitting in the conference and the only people that he could, he could understand everybody else because he was telepathic. And the only way he could communicate though was with the signs that he had developed with my engineer friend to answer the, the question. But here's a man, an alien from another planet, sitting in a conference in 1968 in Los Alamos headquarters on the progress of learning how to bridge the gap between the alien technology and ours. They were going to suggest to the American generals additional technology exchange projects, and I think they were using me as the test guinea pig to take me on board the scout craft, and then they could test my reaction to what, what I was impressed with and what I wasn't with. My life changed, and I was never, ever quite the same. So the study itself was not as complete as it could have been. They concluded what they wanted to conclude. One, there was not a threat involved. Two, 
They weren't the Soviets. Three, the evidence was overwhelming. They were extraterrestrial. Four, there were four groups involved. Four different groups. And they were all humanoid, but they were not human. Only one of the four was what we considered to be human. One group out of the four looked so much like us. I mean, almost identical to us. They could have put on a, these guys could have put on a suit and tie. And for the, the females, because we covered, encountered some of them as well, they could have put on a dress, suit and tie, coat, jacket, sit down with you, next to you in a restaurant, sit next to you in a theater. You'd never know. Le persone come noi, che hanno un corpo come noi, negli extraterrestri, in questi UFO, che io prendo poi quando parlo, lo prendo in senso largo, cioè anche delle persone che o sono dentro l'apparecchio, o le persone sono dentro il craft, o, ma questo è molto molto difficile pensarlo, oppure comandano, ma sono distanze enormi, se si fanno vedere da noi, mica c'è un pianeta che è a mille chilometri da noi, se no a mille chilometri ci sarebbero già arrivati. Quindi è molto ragionevole che siano dentro. So it's, it's probably uh, logical that they're inside a craft uh, instead of coming from somewhere else without a craft. E quindi sono persone come noi composte di una parte spirituale they're, they're, che la chiamiamo anima. Gli UFO, io non ho mai parlato con un UFO e eh, non ho avuto de, eh. He says they, he says they, they would have to be have a soul like we Ma che do. abbiano anche un corpo, devono averlo un corpo. They'd have to have some kind of body. E se no sarebbero angeli. Uh, otherwise they would be angels. Eh. How can countries, one of which actually borders with the United States, be having UFO visitations by the hundreds when other major nations of our world insist that they are not? And even more importantly, how can these countries' governmental policies, both official and otherwise be, that they never have had UFO or alien contact? The only logical explanation is in fact that governments are willing to lie. For the past nine years, I've been researching into the United States government files on what they have on the UFO phenomenon and all sorts of different conspiracies. And I've reached 183,000 pages of government documents on the internet. There is a political block, what I call a truth embargo, instituted by the government, that they are not ready to formally acknowledge uh, this, quote, presence. Anything that involved absolute proof like hardware and bodies was siphoned off completely into another track. They just can't allow information to come out overnight so people would be perturbed and actually demand that something be done about it. They stonewall it, deny it, lie about it for, you know, 30, 40 years, and then finally just announce it as if it's fact, and everybody goes, yeah, okay. It's clear we're dealing with a cosmic water gate, meaning some few people within major governments have known since at least July 1947, when two crash flying saucers and several alien bodies were recovered in New Mexico, that indeed some UFOs are alien spacecraft. The government set up Project Blue Book, the Air Force did, um, in order to uh, investigate this subject on a, you might say, a low level. Researchers, uh, mostly regular citizens, have proven without a doubt there's an extraterrestrial presence. We're being engaged. The evidence is overwhelming. And in some cases, you can actually point to where the Air Force explanation com completely contradicts what's inside the, uh, the, the sighting report itself. The word UFO is actually a disinformation term that was invented after they knew that they weren't unidentified and they knew they didn't fly. So it's sort of a, a mind play. When the uh, first uh, evidence of ET visitation and, and hardware and so along and so on came, came along, the U.S. government took the attitude that uh, we couldn't release this to the general public because it had extreme implications for defense. We don't want our enemies to know that we've got one because then they might try to get one. To the extent that we might be able to back engineer the technology, we don't want to uh, tell somebody else that we're trying to do such a thing. 
Gus Grissom, who was probably the person I was closest to, uh, felt that they were spam in a can, that, that the astronauts were just a public relations campaign for a secret military program that was spending much more. The, the military space program was getting, you know, was a, was a gleaming jewel compared to the junk that NASA was getting at the time. You can get a certain amount of information out through the large media, but it's very superficial and very brief. That's what we found. The in-depth sort of disclosure of what's really going on, who's behind it, what the agenda is, that is almost always stopped. Or if they try to do it, it gets turned into something ridiculous. I, I almost hate the term UFOs because they're <laughs> they really aren't unidentified to the, the people that know what's going on or the researchers too. But it's uh, what a lot of people that have the answers felt it was safe to come out of the water, so they're putting out their information on the internet, uh, you know, disguised or whatever. But the, so these other agents per se, they're they're scanning all the time to counteract what's being said by other people from Intel that think it was safe to, okay, we can put this out, or they feel like it's the right thing to do now. It, you know, enough is enough, mankind has a right to know type thing. When I worked for Douglas, I was assigned to the Douglas Skyrocket. They wanted me to wire up a camera out on the wingtip that looked through a quartz window back at the canopy so that they could monitor the pilot to see what he was doing. While I went, uh, through the hangar, which was secured. Uh, there were two gentlemen in there. They introduced themselves. One was Naval Intelligence, the other one was CIA. And I started working, doing my job, wiring up the, the camera. While they sat around and talked, it became very apparent to me that they were there for that purpose, to talk. They knew about all my flying saucer experiences, all the way from Korea. They told me Intelligence, CIA intelligence group, had three intelligence digests, flying saucer photographs, witness documentation from all over the world. And they said that I should probably try to, to get those three copies. And that's when I wrote uh, Admiral Freeman and wasn't able to get the documents, incidentally. <laughs> but uh, in addition to that, they told me that I should tell people of what, what my experiences were, have been. And uh, so tell everybody you can, uh, because they can't. They were not allowed to talk about it. There's this curtain of ridicule that's been drawn up around the uh, UFO phenomenon. And as long as that curtain of ridicule holds solid, uh, the scientists will be afraid to uh, contribute anything to uh, looking into UFOs. And part of that curtain of ridicule involves the fact that uh, hardly any decent papers have gotten into the refereed scientific literature. So that curtain of ridicule may be slightly opened up now that they have a, a paper that they can refer to and the, if they feel like writing to their own, their own papers on UFOs. The secrecy has invaded like a cancer many institutions, including the media, government, corporations. I got into more and more controversial uh, and exotic subjects. I found myself a journalist without a journal. Uh, there is definitely very tight control over the flow of information in certain topics through our corporate control mass media. They seem to take it upon themselves to be the gatekeepers of information. Um, part of this information that they are keeping from us is the just absolutely immense wealth of information concerning the UFO phenomena and the fact that it can be tracked and documented all the way back through history. The only institution that is more corrupt than what I'm describing as this rogue transnational kleptocracy is the major media. More, worse than the Congress, worse than the White House, worse than anything at the normal level of clearances at the Pentagon is big media. Big media does not report the truth about these things because they are not free to. And we think in the United States and in the Western world we really have a free press. We have a free press on everything that's not important. On the really important issues, it's very controlled. And this is the most important issue. This is the biggest secret in the history of the human race, the known modern history of government. And they have cooperated with keeping this secret. How is this cover-up 
contained and maintained uh, through international borders? Uh, and if it is, are their motivations the same? The best guess is that since America has such overwhelming economic power, the only worse thing than America being mad at you is for America to ignore you. There are so many countries, uh, economies depend uh, on America that I think that they take their orders from America in some ways. When it comes to the cover-up, I think that's one of them. The U.S. government is not only pressuring Brazilian government, but it's making pressure over almost all countries that are somehow aligned politically aligned to the United States. Now, all South America, except maybe for Chile and Venezuela, which, who has Chavez, who's a rebel, all the rest of South America, Latin America, is very aligned to U.S. politics. So all these countries will do just exactly U.S. president to tells them. It is keep this under wraps. Recent media polls show that over 100 million people in the United States alone believe that there is some form of extraterrestrial life. 45% believe that the Earth has been visited by extraterrestrial beings. Nationally known journalists continue to turn a deaf ear to the public's demands for true investigative reporting on a daily basis. Accepting instead the dribble of denial from numerous government agencies as fact while refusing to interview the legions of researchers who have made serious scientific investigation of UFOs and alien contact their life's work. What else are the governments of the world not saying? What if there is positive proof that UFOs do in fact exist? What if that proof has existed for years but has been hidden neatly within the fabric of a system of lies and grand deception? we need to be very concerned about the way in which this whole area has been managed by the national security agencies responsible. By maintaining secrecy, keeping people in the dark, it means that we really don't know whether this secrecy and withholding the information, withholding the technologies from the general public arena is really for the best interest of all of us. The problem has been since the early 50s, and uh, I have the government documents, they had, the United States government has instituted a policy of denial and control over the information. Nothing happening there, folks. Nothing happening there, folks. And if somebody persists in saying, but I saw it, then they're ridiculed. You've got to screw loose. Something's not right with them. This is absolutely just unconscionable in a country that uh, pays lip service to freedom and individual liberty because there have been so many people whose lives have been wrecked, whose families have been wrecked because of this policy of denial and ridicule over a phenomena that has happened worldwide for centuries. Disclosure has a very defined definition. It means the, uh, the formal acknowledgement by the governments of the world of the extraterrestrial presence. As fellow inhabitants of planet Earth, we live in a rapidly changing world. The advent of modern communication networks and the internet has made maintaining the UFO cover-up a difficult and demanding undertaking. Brian Vike of HBCC UFO is the number one UFO website to send information to. Uh, him and uh, Rents and UFO Casebook are the three places that I always send my footage to because they will only put verified sightings on their site. They just won't put junk up there. And I know they get over three, four, uh, up to 10 million hits a month. For over half a century, the United States, Great Britain, and a host of aligned countries have been able to maintain a vast web of secrecy over what is actually happening worldwide relative to aliens, or what are generally known as EBEs, extraterrestrial biological entities. But that is rapidly changing, and disclosure, the lifting of the truth embargo, is now taking place. I'll be getting over 500,000 hits this month, but the interesting uh, thing about that is, is that a couple of thousand of those hits each month are from the military. As far as sharing information on the internet, that is the best way to do it, and probably the safest way, only because I know I've sent DVDs to people and they haven't received them. And um, I would email them and say, look, I'm gonna send you a DVD, can you analyze it for me and let me know what you think this is? And two weeks later, they'll email me and say, I never got it. I'm just waiting for that day when they come knocking on my door 
and want to talk to me about it. But uh, until that day, I think I think they know who I am. I think they know we're here. I think this is the way it's going to be done from here on out. Because the military definitely doesn't want to talk about it anymore. Because everything at night to them is a flare or an airplane. On the contrary, we have all this evidence that shows otherwise. Like the dawning of a new day, the internet is quickly sweeping away the darkness. The truth will not be stopped. We're in this strange reality, which we're caught between two worlds, between two paradigms. Um, and the bridge between, or the door between these two paradigms is what is now called the disclosure event. Recently in Washington, D.C., a press conference was held in conjunction with an international event, the X Conference, where a panel of eminent scientists and researchers broke the silence and spoke out and called for a full international disclosure and an end to the truth embargo relative to UFOs and extraterrestrials. If I was an in-the-know person, high up in government or finance, and I knew about the extraterrestrial issue, and I knew about sequestered technology, and I knew what it could do when it was released, my position would be this. Let's keep that technology uh, under wraps uh, as long as possible while we sell as much of the rest of the oil as we can for as much as possible. And then we'll own, take that money, and we'll use that to own the extraterrestrial technology. Right? The point is, there's always people in the know and out of the know. Sometimes it's about stuff and, you know, you're in or you're out. But there are some things you, you can't have the in the know and out of the know. Basically what we're calling on today is for the government of the United States to take the issue of extraterrestrial life where it has been stuck in conflict and uh, for the last 60 years and take it out of the military in, in intelligence agencies and put it into the Department of Education and the scientific departments where it belongs. Take it out of the threat scenario agencies where it is funded as a potential threat and put it into the opportunity agencies where it is funded as a matter of education and advancement of knowledge for mutual benefit. There is an overwhelming mass of proven real government documents that have been released largely through the Freedom of Information Act that show decades of, for example, airspace violations, very sensitive places by objects doing what appear to be the impossible. We have these documents from the 1940s, we have them from the 1950s, we have them from the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and beyond. So these airspace violations continue. They are provocative. They are, at times, seemingly confrontational. You have pilots who have been going, who have been charged with going up to get these things, and they have described them at times, saying, yes, it appears to be a metallic disc-shaped, there it goes. I began on this topic by trying to do reverse engineering on gravity control devices in 1968, but now I'm officially looking at leaked question documents. And some of the documents tell an amazing story. One of the leaked documents started with FDR, and FDR had set up, through Vannevar Bush, a committee called the Non-Terrestrial Science and Engineering Committee. These were guys, after the recovery of a crash flying saucer in 1942, who were given the parts and go told to figure out how they work. They came back to FDR in 1944 and asked for money. And he said, no, we've got to win the war first, beat the Nazis. And then in 1947, it was Vannevar Bush who went to President Truman, who didn't know about all this, and said, by the way, we have these craft. We could do some reverse engineering in order to improve our country, to improve our culture, to improve our standard of living. And that was when the money started to flow. July 2002, right here in the Washington, D.C. area, there was yet again a airspace jet chase by two F-16 jet interceptors, which were chasing a bluish object right outside D.C. My opinion right now is the person who's going to wait for hard evidence is going to be left behind when the deluge comes.
exopolitics offers a bridge out of the permanent warfare state, the permanent warfare economy, out of the permanent warfare industry, into transforming the permanent warfare industry into a cooperative, peaceful, space age society integrating with universal society. So I began to look outside of the kind of conventional sphere. I began to explore theories for, for what it is that really is driving international politics. And so then I came up with this area of an undisclosed uh, extraterrestrial presence that is kept from the general public. So that really did help me understand what was going on and what is driving international politics. What's important is the structural blinders and the structural uh, belief patterns and the structural paradigm. If, if the exopolitics model can come in and, and, uh, and establish itself as the dominant paradigm such that structurally within academia, the earth is no longer flat, it is now round, intelligent life no longer ends at the geostationary orbit. The universe is now highly populated. It's that sort of sea change that we need to unleash the huge public investment and private explosion of creativity and cooperation to turn our spaceship around to be able to survive the environmental pressures that are coming now, which have been the result of the embargo that we've been under. Are we the people of Earth on the verge of technological destruction? Has our use and testing of nuclear weapons already triggered an interdimensional countdown that is now moving us as a planet towards some kind of interstellar intervention? Even though there's clearly no evidence, I don't want to emphasize this, that these extraterrestrial civilizations are hostile towards us, I think they're very worried about our hostility. I always turn this on its head because most of these sort of uh, documentaries are always like alien invasion and all this stuff. No, 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 no. The issue is that, you know, if they were hostile, we would know it by now. It's clear to me that what's going on is that they're very concerned that at the time that humanity reached the ability to go into space, early space exploration, 50s, we also had already developed weapons of mass destruction and thermonuclear and hydrogen bombs and stuff. And that the coincidence of that, the coming together of those two things, put a big red flag over Earth. And so if you look at the databases from the 50s, 60s, 70s on forward, not only in the United States, but in Great Britain, in um, the Soviet Union, in China, that wherever we had uh, space, aerospace, and nuclear facilities, there were a lot of these so-called UFOs being seen. These groups that are interested in us, at least seem to show some benevolence, I think would probably step in and keep us from blowing the hell out of ourselves if it push come to show. The onset of the whole UFO phenomena beginning about 1946-47, and that I don't think it's coincidence that that coincided with our development of nuclear weapons. And I think that out in the universe, they were horrified. They said, oh my God, the kids have found the matches. Well, they don't want us to destroy ourselves, and they don't want us to destroy this planet, and yet they're prohibited from directly intervening in our affairs and in our evolution. So I think that we've got crop circles and animal mutilations and abductions and sightings and increasing sightings and all like that so that it's not directly impacting on us and yet over this conditioning period we are coming to understand that we're not the only ones in the universe and I think they're trying to kind of boost us up the evolutionary ladder so that we can grow to be full class members of the intergalactic community instead of destroying ourselves through our petty bickering wars and nuclear holocaust. Like the dawning of a new day, the internet is quickly sweeping away the darkness. The truth will not be stopped. We're now seeing this wall of censorship cracking apart in the United States. Just recently we had a major TV network special and uh, I found it absolutely amazing because Peter Jennings of ABC flat just very matter-of-factly told a national audience 
that the Robinson panel of the 50s and the Operation Blue Book, Project Blue Book of the 60s uh, were not really scientific-based investigations. They were just public relations efforts to try to get people not to be thinking about UFOs. So in other words, all you folks out there who are old enough to have been seen all the newspaper reports on the Robinson panel and hear what Blue Book said, uh, it was just hogwash. Never mind. The non-human intelligence presence has been here for a long time that Colonel Philip Corso said there are 57 different races and that some accords were made to talk about their, uh, their presence, whether it be Hollywood, movies, or whatever, including the ABC special, that if it isn't done soon, they will probably do it. Extraterrestrials are not a national security issue. They're an educational and social issue for our society, and they may be a spiritual issue. When I retired from the military, I went to work for the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and I worked with them for 14 years. So I've got 42 years of government service behind me, and throughout all those years, I had the very highest security classification you could have, top secret. When I was in NATO in 1963, through 1967, I had cosmic top secret, which was and still is the highest level of security in NATO. That's how I got involved in this, this crazy UFO field. Through the 50s and 60s and 70s, we referred to uh, aliens as extraterrestrials. But now that science has been catching up with us uh, to a certain degree, we have changed our our definition of an alien. It's probably more accurate to call them uh, extra-dimensional beings uh, because that would explain their ability to uh, traverse vast distances. They operate in more dimensions. I mean, even the current theoretical uh, model of the universe is upwards of 30 dimensions. So we're living in a multi-dimensional universe. And so it's not uncommon to theorize that we're going to encounter beings that operate in more dimensions than we do. And that would explain a lot of the phenomenon related to UFOs, how they're able to appear and disappear, move very fast, do all the things that the ETs go, walk through walls, uh, ha have remarkable psychic abilities and, and sort of communicate telepathically. It would really go a long way to explaining the phenomenon surrounding it. What looks like magic to us can really be explained through extra dimensionality. Are any of us really prepared for the kind of paradigm shift that would come with not just disclosure, but with contact and communication with intelligences from other worlds? Is it possible that as a species we have reached the point that our minds actually filter and generate acceptable constructs which all too often become our day-to-day -day realities? There is so little of your reality <laughs> that is really based on truth that it's just stunning. Ho sentito dire che ci sono altri mondi abitati. I heard I've heard that there are other worlds that are inhabited. E Padre Pio rispose. Padre Pio answered. E che voi che solo noi in questo piccolo pianeta che è il nostro mondo a massimo Dio, ma ci saranno tanti altri mondi nei quali ameranno il Signore. There, you, uh, would you believe that it would just be our tiny world that would be giving glory to God? There has to be many more worlds, many more planets that, that exist with, with, with inhabitants that would be giving glory to God. It is not just us. If I told you that, uh, you know, the very nature of the moon and Mars and most of the planets in the solar system uh, is being kept from you for specific reasons, to make you think that you're completely alone and that these planets can't be colonized. Back in the 50s, the big question was, do they come from Mars or do they come from Venus? And by the 60s and 70s, we had gotten a little more sophisticated in our, in our intellect and our thinking, and the question became, well, do they come from Alpha Centauri or Zeta Reticula Four? you know? Well, and then now we're up to the day and we've got even more sophisticated. And now the question is, do they come from another planet or do they come from another dimension? Or are they perhaps time travelers? Do they come from another time, okay? 
And in my study of all of this, I have kind of come to the conclusion that the answer is yes. The more you know about this field, it becomes almost paralyzing because the more you know, the less you know. Uh, the more you know and the more open-minded you are about this, the more you realize that, the, that every answer you find just leads to a, a, you know, a, a thousand more questions. Vast sums of money are being siphoned through these different agencies into the coffers of the CIA, which then forwards this money on to the DOD. And this money is funneled through the DOD and goes into the black projects, which the DOD has direct oversight over. So the CIA is kind of like the bag man, it collects the money, it goes to the Department of Defense that actually administers how this money is going to be spent on different black projects. So the size, how much are we talking about? I think the, the best indication for just how much we're talking about here are, are the auditing irregularities that the Inspector General of the Department of Defense has himself identified. He identified in, in three years, it was uh, 1998, 1999 and the year 2000. In those three years, we identified on average $1.7 trillion could not be accounted for in the Department of Defense budget. In other words, this was money that was, was being moved around in ways that could not be accounted for. And I think what that indicates is the true size of the black budget. We're, we're looking at an infrastructure that is funded by as much as $1.7 trillion a year. Now when you consider that the whole Department of Defense budget officially is just over $400 billion, we're talking about a, we're talking about a vast infrastructure that is four times greater than the entire Department of Defense budget. As Jack Nicholson would say, you can't handle the truth. Is it possible that ancient and secret societies exist? that have always had the real but hidden information? And have they, as a result of their ongoing familial knowledge, been manipulating and governing virtually all countries down through the centuries? Researchers point to the Illuminati and the power elite and their use of propaganda as carried by the mainstream media. Many believe that these powerful few actually control almost all information by implanting false knowledge and beliefs into our human collective reality. Essentially everything that you would want to know has been covered up. Uh, from the electrogenetic magnificence of your DNA being a spiritual antenna to the creator to the most uh, amazing Pythagorean mystery school mathematics that is essentially freeing to humanity and in essence also very, very clear that everything in our world is a divine creation and as the math is the expressive tool of the creator for creationism. The United States government, the leader of the free world, is totally controlled by a wealthy oligarchy, a small handful of people that are just super rich. Most of them are not even in government, but they tell the government what to do. These are the people who are behind the UFO secrecy. They don't care if you know there's ETs out there, but if you know there's ETs out there, then you will know that there is alternative technology. And this could ex upset their monopolies over energy, fuel, transportation, communications, pharmaceuticals. And that's what they don't want. After all, who would continue to pay all these ever increasing prices for gasoline that's polluting the air, choking us all, killing our kids? Why would we do that if we knew beyond any shadow of a doubt that there was non-polluting energy sources out there. This is what it's all about. It comes back to the old journalistic adage, follow the money. Everything has been covered up. The toxicities of the pharmaceuticals, you're not learning the truth about vaccinations, you're not learning the truth about various medications. The pharmaceutical industrialists, which I prefer to call the military medical petrochemical pharmaceutical cartel, essentially has control of the media, the mainstream media, and so it has control over the mass mind. And as a result of those powers that they assert, people are not given the factual information upon which to make informed decisions. They're given propaganda, and as a result, the choices that people are making are genocidal. And I say genocidal with a strict definition, meaning the mass killing of people for economic, political, and or ideological reasons. And those 
Pharmaceutical industrialists are intimately connected to those people who wish to control populations. They've published the literature, what their intent is, not only how best to control populations, why populations need to be controlled, but ultimately affecting the technologies that are in place to do just that. Currently, 50% reduction in general of the planet's population that has been targeted for elimination. The disclosure project's oriented towards putting together credible government documents and these witnesses so that there is an undeniable case made that this is real and not fictitious. It started really in 19, the early 1990s, and after I had briefed the uh, uh, President Clinton's first CIA director on this problem, it was made very clear to me that the executive branch of the U.S. government did not want to do this because, I am quoting, the President was concerned he would end up like Jack Kennedy. I'm not kidding. That was said to me by President Clinton's closest friend. Could it be that much of what we believe is illusion? Is it possible that the history of human civilization is not as we have been told? Have we as people been purposefully dumbed down? And have our governments only served to strengthen the bonds that bind us to our ignorance, not only of our past, but of our present and potential future? Officials in these agencies no longer represent the best interests of humanity, but are now representing the interests of a particular extraterrestrial race that they have been compromised by. So we, we pay a heavy price if we don't make this open, if we don't bring in transparency and accountability into this whole uh, process, it means that we don't know whether or not those that are behind the policies are actually implementing these policies for the best interest of humanity, which is what they claim, or for the best interest of a particular extraterrestrial race. Some of the questions that we must ask include, are there bases on our moon? Are there structures and life forms on Mars and many of the other local planets? Have our governments made deals and treaties with other life forms that affect the future of all of us on planet Earth? These people will continue zipping through our atmosphere, checking uh, nuclear plants and so forth and so on. They have never been hostile. They pose no air security uh, problems, whatever. The Air Force knows this, and the Air Force has made statements to that effect that UFOs pose no, no threat. They are here. Not just the Greys, but the others who look and act like us. Perhaps they are here to instruct us, to help us safeguard our planet. Definitely rules and regulations that govern everything. And the councils have the history books of all of the planets and all the records. So when a planet reaches the point that it can support life, that's a very momentous time in the history of that planet. At that time, the planet is given its life charter. We're dealing with a big, big story. It's not just them. As I said, if it was that simple, it would probably been out some time back. It's really about us. It's who we are, what we are, how we came to be, and where we might end up go, going sometime. Life is never allowed to just simply spontaneously develop. And if it, would, if it did, it would be very chaotic. If we could integrate, I call it the spiritual, but the esoteric or whatever, my, I mean true esoteric. I don't mean religion necessarily because there's a difference, I think, between religion and spirituality. To produce a thinking, intelligent human being would have taken millions more years if it was happening by normal evolution than it would have taken. And it would still not have got to the point we are now. They create life on other planets because this is the way they were created, by what they call the archaic ones, the ones from the very beginning have been doing this forever. Mankind was developed as a species, as a spiritual being, and I think we've gotten so far away from who we really are that it's very hard for us to go back there and digest that maybe we have cosmic brothers and sisters. We fight among ourselves for diversity. I mean, if anybody walks in here and looks totally different, we fight among ourselves. Now I'm thinking, oh my God, what are the, uh, the ETs that are involved thinking about the way we handle ourselves with people that are so different from us? They're probably scared to death to appear because of what we might do to them. We have not handled diversity very well. Yeah, one day, uh, I, I would hope that the people of Earth 
would stand up and extend their hand in friendship to these people. We have never done that here on this planet. You know, we've shot at them. <laughs> we've done everything. We fire radar, we fire lasers, everything. We need to say hi. <laughs> There are other extraterrestrial groups who are human looking, such as the Pleiadians, the, the famous Pleiadians of Billy Meyer and, and others. And they are much more intent on trying to assist humanity to um, become free of this kind of manipulation from other races that really try to use humanity as, as a resource. Let's think about it. You can't say, whoopee star kids, these wonderful advanced children have been transformed by contact from people from the stars, when in the same breath you say there's no such things as UFOs. The question of UFOs and extraterrestrials, most people just think is something entertaining. In reality, it's something that is central to how we're going to be able to go forward as a civilization, because that issue involves sciences, technologies, energy and propulsion systems that could give us a whole new civilization. It's terribly important the whole thing come apart because it's all one package and it's part of our bright and very, I think, hopeful future. And I think of these star kids growing up and being our leaders, our presidents, Congress people, senators, university professors, um, leaders in medicine and science and so forth. Uh, I think what brilliant and expansive future we're gonna have, but we have to get from point A to point B. And, this cover-up is just stultifying us in a very painful way. Is it possible that an intergalactic federation exists and that this collective of different member beings are in the process of offering the people of Earth membership in a federation of planets? Most importantly for all of us and our children, some of these researchers say that acceptance of their invitation to federation membership would end all war, starvation and dependency upon fossil fuel based energy systems for our entire planet. Part of the problem with the UFO cover up coming apart, you've got to uncover the whole thing at the same time, you can't half uncover. The people who try to only look stupid. They mean extraterrestrial. Le fanno per noi specialmente. But they're doing it for us, they are praying for us. Eh, si siamo la categoria più bassa che esiste. E loro abbiamo we bisogno di pregare. We are the lowest of the category of, 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 uh, in the evolutionary scale. He really believes that humanity is the lowest of the category of the evolutionary scale with all the proof that he gave you of the ecological problem, of the war problem, of the uh, you know, choosing evil problem and all that. He, this is his belief system. We all have a responsibility to find out what the truth is about something like this. And it is, people have to take responsibility for looking into what the truth is. We've put together the means for people to do that. Now people have to take the initiative, and we need all the help we can get. I would ask people to help us network this to anyone and any institution that can help. The reason this is so critical is that we've reached a point in our civilization where for us to go forward as a people, we're gonna to have to end this kind of illegal secrecy, and we're going to have to allow this information and these technologies to get out and begin to fix many of these large problems. I've always believed our destiny is in the stars. That's, that's a hope that I have, that generations yet to come will travel out there and will become a part of that community. That's a dream that I won't live to see, but it's a dream I hold dear, that we'll make it that we will survive as a species. Because I think we've got some, as I jokingly say, we have some good friends in high places.